Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sorry I haven't been with you earlier this evening. Um, but I wanted to uh, come tonight both to make a few remarks but also to answer some questions, although that's not scheduled, so I hope you don't mind. You, uh, but uh, think of some difficult ones. Um, my main message to you, though, is that the uh, UK's energy uh, landscape is being transformed. Um, coal is being phased out as a means of generating electricity. Um, we're seeing gradually a whole host of renewable technologies filling that gap, low-carbon technologies uh, coming forward. Indeed, the low-carbon share of the UK electricity mix is increasing all the time, and the costs of renewables are reducing all the time. Uh, look out for some interesting announcements this Thursday. Um, we here in Britain are clean energy pioneers and clean energy policy pioneers. We're the only country in Europe to seriously uh, invest in carbon capture and storage. We're the number one location in the world for offshore wind and tidal energy investment. Indeed, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, obviously I want to give them a mention, uh, estimated that the average annual investment in clean energy has doubled this parliament and hit another record level in 2014. And to do more of this, we put in place an unprecedented financial structure through the 2013 Energy Act to drive carbon reduction in uh, energy. The legal obligations we've set ourselves under the Climate Change Act 2008 with the carbon budgets provide a, a long-term stability for the direction of travel, and we've augmented those uh, in this parliament, uh, not just with the 2013 Energy Act, but with the work that we've done in Europe, uh, le Britain leading the way for the 2030 Energy and Climate Change Package. Um, that's going to be, that's already creating a transformation, it's going to create a transformation in the future. But of course, we shouldn't just focus on the generation side. On the, sub, uh, on the demand side, uh, we have done an awful lot on energy efficiency and demand reduction, and I think those policies are going to enter a new phase. Uh, the development of the save-as-you uh, pay models uh, is bedding in, uh, linking demand reduction markets to the capacity market, uh, I think, is definitely a way forward. And I personally believe, speaking as a Liberal Democrat, that long-term regulations and targets uh, are going to be essential in energy efficiency policy over the next uh, decade. And we've developed some new regulations, uh, not been always easy in the coalition, uh, but I was pleased to publish recently some new regulations on energy efficiency in the private rented uh, sector. We've also seen major change in the retail market. Uh, we've seen a, a new cohort of uh, hungry, innovative, independent suppliers taking on uh, the big incumbents, the big six, They've already increased their market share. In 2010, was less than 1%. It's now over 10% and rising fast. That's a big change. And, of course, the rollout of smart technology over the next uh, parliament uh, with uh, smart meters in people's homes and workplaces will create a digital revolution in the energy space, which is long overdue and I think will result in a lot of innovation. So as we move towards uh, a cleaner, smarter, more climate-friendly mix of energy sources, the opportunities for individuals, for collectives and local communities to take more control of energy use and indeed generate uh, electricity and heat themselves uh, have really been increasing. Uh, the technology in the markets, I think, are making community energy a much bigger opportunity than many in the energy industry have yet uh, to realise. And I wanted tonight to reiterate the government's commitment to this uh, development and my personal commitment to it. Um, I believe community energy can play a critical role in tackling climate change and in meeting our future energy uh, needs. In the huge nationalised energy system that we had in the last century, energy wasn't seen as a commodity that could be made and bought and sold by local people, small traders or, co or, or cooperatives. It was a big business dominated by big corporations. And it's been a frustrating journey to get to where we are now in many ways. But I do think we are seeing the beginning of a change in that model. Um, I think we will see uh, small energy projects making energy for the community, in the community, as increasingly viable business propositions, <coughs> attracting the sorts of investment that many of you will be aware of. This is not to say that large companies and large-scale energy generation won't play a significant role in meeting our future energy needs. Of course they will. We'll need big projects 
whether it's offshore wind or, or indeed new nuclear, in order to meet our low carbon uh, challenge. But I think a vision of a future market where there's an awful lot more smaller players uh, is one that uh, we should encourage so we don't have the domination by just a small number that we've seen uh, in the past. Um, it also has a huge advantage, uh, community energy, over the big players. I think it can connect people to the challenge of cl climate change, and I think it can help both regenerate communities and re-empower them in a very uh, meaningful way. But I'm absolutely clear that this is still very early days for community energy. Um, like any new sector, there are a lot of hurdles. The, the system isn't geared up to community energy. The regulators aren't geared up to community energy. The tax system isn't geared up to uh, community energy. The technological solutions that we've had in the past aren't geared up to it. So we will need to work hard to overcome those hurdles. Um, I'm determined that we make the path uh, as easy as possible for the future uh, investors. And, and if we do that, that will enable, I think, best practice and innovation uh, to flourish. So um, it was quite bizarre when we were working on the community energy strategy to see actually how little had been done in Whitehall in the past. And to actually say that last January saw this country's first ever community energy strategy, in many ways, is quite a startling thing uh, to say, but it is true. Um, and I've seen in the last year uh, a real, uh, I, I think, a real positive response from uh, the third sector, from community groups, and from business to, to the strategy. I'm really grateful for those of you who were involved in its design and, and those who've taken up the challenge. We've had the workshops uh, in everything from finance to grid connections to models of ownership to hydropower to skills and support, and they've been really uh, valuable with the recommendations they've put to government. Um, and what we saw when we were developing the community energy strategy was just the range of community energy projects that are around the country, small uh, and even tiny. Uh, we calculated uh, and, and found about 5,000 community energy projects, some just advice and, and, and guidance on tackling fuel poverty, others uh, investing significant sums of money in, in wind projects and solar projects. So I think we learned in developing the energy strategy the, the, the appetite that there is uh, in communities across the country, and we want to, to encourage that. Of course, finance is always the key question, um, but we're seeing groups increasingly able to access finance, uh, whether it's from the banking community we just heard about or other means. Community share offers alone uh, have raised 35 million since 2012. Now, to some in the audience, that may not seem an awful lot of money, but from where the sector is coming from, I think that's actually a startling amount for a sector that's relatively uh, new. Um, the challenge, of course, is making sure that uh, future community energy uh, group startups have greater access to finance, and that's what you've been discussing today, and it's what we've been uh, working on. Uh, last year, I launched the £10 million Urban Community Energy Fund, which is administered by Pure Leapfrog and the Centre for Sustainable Energy. We've already had uh, nearly 200 expressions of interest, um, and we will start paying out some money. This week, we're approving the first 12 new projects, totaling over £140,000. Uh, of course, its counterpart, the 50 million Rural Community Energy Fund, is a little bit more advanced. It's already supporting 50 rural community energy projects and has distributed over £1 million. You will have heard uh, from the Green Investment Bank earlier, but securing state aid clearance to enable the GID to uh, invest in community energy was, I think, a significant development and will be, I think, pretty uh, a real catalyst to, to more. Of course, we'll need to do more. You'll have heard from um, some more expert speakers than I of, of some of the uh, ideas afoot, whether it's from the Green Investment Bank, from the Big Society Capital, from Esme Fairbairn, from Pure Leapfrog. And what I'm excited about is the level of activity, the level of new thinking. Um, I, I think that is really positive and I hope will attract even more community energy pioneers knowing that there is, is this activity. We tried in the community energy strategy to try to encourage more of that. We ha created a finance round table uh, which brought together banks, advisors and community energy 
practitioners, and they've made a lot of proposals to government, and they're being actively considered. Uh, we want to make sure that projects uh, are bankable as early as possible by getting them the right professional support uh, early in their process. And to try to bring industry and community energy practitioners together was part of the thinking behind setting up the shared ownership uh, task force. We think shared ownership models may be a way of really stimulating um, more rapid growth in, in the sector and by uh, bringing that professional expertise. Uh, and I'm really grateful for both industry players and uh, community energy practitioners who served on that task force. And just last November, we saw the launch of their protocol to guide the offer of shared ownership for communities and developers. And I'll sh shortly be publishing the government's response uh, to the shared ownership task force, but it will, I can give you a sneak preview. It will be certainly supporting their framework and uh, building on the guidance and support that uh, they uh, put forward. I'm pleased about Pure Leapfrog's announcements today, support community energy projects who want to invest in shared ownership projects. I think this, the concept behind what Pure Leapfrog are talking about, making sure that community energy projects are more investor ready uh, and understand the concept of bridge finance, I think is going to be very, very important for a lot of projects around uh, the country. Um, but of course, there'll be many in the room who are saying, well, this is all very well, there's been lots of positive things, but what about the negative things? And uh, this year, I know people have been concerned about, and indeed last year, about uh, the FCA's consultation uh, and the future of tax relief. So let me uh, comment on those, and then no doubt you want to question me. Um, on the FCA, uh, I think it, and the FCA is an independent regulator, uh, we don't uh, control them, nor should we, but in their work, what they are trying to do is ensure that there are high standards of investor protection. That has to be important for the long-term sustainable future of the community energy sector. So I think while there, uh, no doubt we need a, a learning process, and I think the consultation has already been a very effective learning process, I think the aims uh, and underlying concerns of the FCA ought to be concerns of people in the sector itself. Uh, I recently met uh, Martin Wheatley, the chief executive, and his team who are focused on this consultation to try to understand uh, what uh, the direction of travel. Uh, my officials have been engaging with uh, their team to make sure they understand not only the significance we place on community energy, but also uh, uh, issues that the sector has. And I, I really came away with a feeling that the FCA is listening and uh, we'll see when they publish their results. They are independent regulators, as I've said, but I think they will uh, uh, have learned from their engagement with you. Uh, we're, of course, working with the Treasury to explore how existing and new tax relief exemptions can be extended. For instance, extending I ISA status to debt instruments issued by community energy organizations uh, and working with the FCA to fully understand the impact of any decisions they may make on energy cooperative uh, models. Um, we do have to remember that the, the sector is relatively mature, uh, immature, and therefore um, we, keep need, we, keep, we need to keep innovating in policy to support uh, the growth. And um, the, the small size of projects has to date hindered the develop, development of community energy project debt. And that's why uh, in December, uh, the government extended the social investment tax relief to include, for the first time, project debt for investments in community energy projects. And I think that will provide a significant incentive uh, to the market. I, I know there are negative perceptions surrounding the removal of the, of the in due course, the removal of the enterprise, incentive, uh, enterprise investment scheme. But I do think the new social investment tax relief is good news uh, for the sector. We're going to closely monitor the sector to understand whether the package of incentive, incentives adequately provides access to finance, including debt finance, that you need. Uh, we want to make sure it does, uh, and we want to hear from you to make sure we can help you navigate the sector around these uh, quite significant changes. Um, I do want, before I conclude, to pay tribute to officials in the department. Um, one of the big asks uh, 
when we were developing the community energy strategy was to have a dedicated unit in the department on community energy. It wasn't something that um, the department was immediately enthusiastic about, it's fair to say, um, but having set it up, the officials working in it have been absolutely brilliant. Uh, and uh, I'm fairly demanding uh, on this issue and uh, uh, want them to do even more uh, and I work them very hard and um, I'm really grateful for the work they've done. And I hope when you see the community uh, energy strategy update, uh, which we'll be launching uh, next month, uh, not only their hard work, but also your, uh, in, your um, input to that, because I think that community energy update will be another key moment in the development of the, the sector. Um, so let me end by just uh, not reading my speech anymore. Uh, sometimes it's a bit tiresome. Uh, but just by saying that um, w although the community energy sector has not had the policy attention that it deserved in the past, it is now getting that. Um, and I believe uh, if we are ambitious, we can surprise people by how quickly the sector can grow and the contribution it can make, not just in renewable electricity, but also renewable heat and energy efficiency, and in empowering uh, communities to take on the challenge of fuel poverty, to take on the challenge of helping people come together uh, for their mutual benefit. So thank you very much for your interest and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah. You've all been tremendously patient. We are going to take a liberty with you. We're going to uh, uh, pass the mic around. We have a mic around. We're going to stop talking. And there are, uh, is a mic coming up? Any questions? Yes, Ramin. Good evening, Ramin Dumukhanian from Yingli Solar, although my question, I promise you, is not solar specific. So we've talked about lots of things this evening that are broken models that are not fit for purpose from the old era and so on. We've talked about the generation side and how that's got to change and the consumption side. The bit we haven't talked about is the middle bit, which is the grid. Uh, assuming that most of your projects have to be grid connected and are not standalone, who's investing in that? Because that, from the practitioner's point of view, is certainly not fit for purpose. Um, well, uh, let me just, uh, that is one of the key questions you get asked the whole time. Uh, people wanting to, to connect and they can't get grid connections, uh, getting frustrated with their local DNOs, uh, and we've heard that time again. It's one of the reasons why, as part of the strategy, we set up a task force to look at the grid connection issue. Um, uh, those who served on that task force, where there were the DNOs, the ENA, and community energy practitioners, I think saw a relationship develop during the work of that task force and a greater understanding from both sides about some of the challenges about the future grid. Um, and certainly I'm told by those people who were more involved in it that already we're seeing, beginning to see the fruits of that process by itself. Um, but the task force made a number of uh, uh, recommendations to me um, my response will be contained in the community energy strategy update. Uh, and the aim is to both go for the low hanging fruit that we can do quickly, that we doesn't need primary legislation. And there are examples of, of that, but that really are possible, not least this better understanding, so people are more responsive. Um, but there are some, some longer term things that we can take, uh, take on board um, and uh, that uh, some which are challenging to the existing system, the way the, the current balancing system works, but we want to work through that. In addition, I should say that we've put a lot of emphasis on, on local supply uh, the outside uh, the grid and building on the, the, the license light proposals of from the past, seeing if there's other things that we can do uh, to, to enable uh, self-supply, local supply, or, uh, and and the working group on that is, I think, important. So we absolutely recognise this as a problem. And uh, it, it's, it's not 
it's not an easy one to solve because um, so there's some genuine technical t issues. But I think the attention it's now got um, uh, makes me feel that over the next year or few years, we can at last uh, tackle them properly, strategically. By the way, uh, in terms of grid, in, in a few years' time, the community is all in the grid. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be good. Um, I'm Matt Brown from Brighton Energy Cooperative. Um, hello. I've got uh, one question and one uh, request, really. So my question is this, is that it's great to see all these people here, and it's great that we've got investment that's so interested. And to be honest with you, We've got people queuing up, um, as probably a lot of people have found. Uh, the problem we have that we come up against every day is twofold. The first one being the council. And to us, it would, you know, we wish we lived in Bristol, but we don't. We live in Brighton, and we run up against this problem. Can, the, can central government, I know you, like, you don't like to centralise, you like to decentralise, but it would be helpful if there was movement from the central government to push, you know, give targets to local government uh, or push them towards <coughs> accepting the work that we do, which we, we come up against that problem all the time. The request that I have is for the people working in the city uh, in investment. The other situation that we come up against is we have, there's roofs everywhere that we would love to put our solar on. And they're all part of uh, property portfolios. Uh, when you try, if you need to contact a freeholder, you can never get to them there's, and they would never be interested. But you guys have the contacts. Is there any way that you can move towards influencing those portfolios in some way to help us do what we're trying to do, the li just the little bit that we're trying to do? Because I know it's not got any financial incentive to those property portfolio holders. Okay. okay. I think we're going to just take a couple more questions, actually, because otherwise, yeah, Merlin will use, yeah. Just make them quick questions so we can get a, a few more people speaking. Yeah, go on. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that, Secretary of State. Merlin Hyman from uh, Regen. Um, just picking up quickly on your shared ownership, and I was uh, pleased to serve on, the, on that task force. Um, we've seen recently the ability to, for a commercial and a community project to share uh, ownership of a, a larger project with one grid connection, generate a lot of interest. There have been at least 20 developers knocking our door asking about how that might work. But it is limited just to project sharing under the feed-in tariff. So quite a specific question about whether DEC might consider opening that opportunity up to project to feed in tariff projects and larger CFD type projects to both for commercial and community projects to be next to each other and share one grid connection. And ROCs. And the RA. Okay, there's a question over here and then there's one over there. Some troublemakers on that row over there. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Davis from Abundance, I guess. Um, We've we'll heard a lot about catalyzing um, communities to organize and get together. Um, the, other, the other ask, I guess, is to catalyze on the investor side. So I um, totally welcome the efforts to get debt securities into ISA. Um, it's a slow progress of lawyers. Um, but hopefully we'll achieve that. But with the Capital Markets Union announcement, Europe's actually looking to the UK to lead on enabling retail investment into what is both infrastructure and small and medium enterprises, it would appear that community energy would be right on the intersection of that. So I guess it's the ask is to engage with that process, um, which would open up trillions of pounds of individuals' money to these types of investments. And at the moment, we, we're still working against barriers to those, because to, we we're talking about people's retirement funds and we're talking about their stuff for their school funds. You've got to have investment products for those people. At the moment, we're not quite catalyzing that side of the matrix. We're looking on the community side, but we also need to look on the investment side. One more over there, Mike. OK. Yeah. Uh, Mike Smythe from Energy for All. It's a linked question to the one that Merlin asked on uh, shared ownership. So I think one of the interesting parts of the strategy was a shared ownership proposal. 
there's a lot of interest in solar farms in pursuing the shared ownership route with communities, half and half, but the feed-in tariff budget is allocated in such a way that two shared ownership schemes would exhaust the budget and trigger uh, a digression. So it, it's, a, it's a, almost like a Pyrrhic policy. Um, as soon as it starts getting used, it disappears. And I think the feed-in tariff, I'm not really asking why you set the feed-in tariff budget, the allocation for it, so low, uh, in effect, to prevent shared ownership. Right, we're going to take those round uh, questions, and I think we're going to uh, give our panellists here, uh, if they want to, a uh, chance to say something else, and then we're going to go and get a drink. Secretary of State, yeah. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure from the question from Brighton uh, what it is that your Green <laughs> Council in Brighton uh, is not doing to uh, assist you. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, normally we have problems of the councils from planning issues and clearly planning guidance needs can be improved and we're going to be addressing that um, uh, in the uh, community energy strategy update um, I, I would be very nervous about central government putting actual targets you're right to to infer that you've got your hand up you want to come back to me well you'll need a mic because we, no one will hear you Um, yeah, it is, it is essentially a planning issue. Um, the council believe that it fetters their future, fetters being the exact word that, that they use, uh, it fetters their future abilities, uh, perhaps like they want, might want to take a building down. You know, our, our, our investments are long term, they're 20 year investments, as it's it, it, long term for most people. Um, if there was you know, some sort of uh, target that they had to meet or, you know, some pressure from central government. Um, and I'm sure they're not the only council. It's not entirely to do... It's not to do with being green or not. It's to do with being forward-thinking, I think. Well, well, I mean, one of the... If you look at the, the planning law, the idea is in the neighbourhood plans that local councils can, can adopt, they can give greater certainty both to uh, the local people and to, to investors particularly in, in renewable uh, energy. So the, there, is, there is a legal framework there that people can use. Not all councils are using it, and one of the things you'll see in the Community Energy Strategy Update is that we're trying to find ways of, of increasing awareness of what is actually possible so you can get a more, uh, more certain, more predictable planning, planning system. Um, I think it is fair to say that uh, on planning side, uh, not all parts of the coalition have... Have, have, have agreed on the right way forward. Um, uh, but you, 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 you talked about solar on, on roofs. Um, we have been looking, and I'm not sure if we've responded yet to the consultation. I know what the answer is, but I'm probably not going to tell you. But we have been consulting on the transferability of solar panels. Because on big, large roof, roof uh, tops, particularly for commercial, uh, often the tenant has only got a, a lease for five, ten years. And it's the twenty-year thing, and they they can't get their uh, the freeholders' uh, permission. So we want to see, and we've been asking questions about how it could be done, about whether the leaseholder were they to invest in solar uh, PV on the roof of their commercial building, whether they'd be able to then take that uh, that solar those solar panels and keep the fits uh, if they put it on another roof. Um, and so we've been looking at that, and I can't tell you what our answer is, but. Um, but we wouldn't have consulted if you weren't interested in the idea. Uh, M M M Mervyn, uh, yeah, I, I was really pleased that officials came up with this idea because we had this problem with EU state aid clearance. We, we wanted projects to go to 10, meg uh, to 10 megawatts and then we couldn't get state aid clearance for it. And they came up with this idea of sharing a, uh, two five megawatts, sharing a grid connection, which I thought was quite ingenious of them. Um, and uh, you're right, it is restricted to, to FIT schemes. Um, I can't, uh, standing up here, think there's a reason why you would um, uh, stop CFDs or ROCs, but there may be one of my officials who think there is. So I certainly I have to take advice on that. Um, uh, but um, I, I don't, wouldn't have an in-principle problem about it. It's a question whether it works legally and practically and with the budgets that we, we do have to keep to. Um, the issue about uh, catalyzing investors, new investment products. I mean, um, I, I don't think DEC should be uh, engaged in, in innovation in financial products. I would rather leave that to the markets and to people in Bloomberg and, and elsewhere. Uh, I'm not sure if that's Whitehall's greatest skills. What I do want to make sure is that we're not doing anything that gets in the way of that sort of innovation. 
Uh, and uh, I think with the Green Investment Bank now uh, a, a player and, uh, and others, that hopefully we will see the sort of innovation that you, you, you feel you, that is needed. Um, the point from Energy for All, I think, is uh, maybe both fair and unfair. I mean, we have a limited budget. We can't, we can't invest in everything. Um, we're re rationing CFDs for large-scale projects through auctions. Uh, and the digression mechanism is there because of the phase, the FIT system in its first, first iteration, which wasn't good news for community energy sector, actually. And the digression mechanism is there to make sure you get value for money. But the budget doesn't go. You just, you just get a lower rate. And I know that, I know that, no, <laughs> I know that might be irritating. But... but well, it, it can be, but, but the, the, the digression is going down, not just because of deployment, because of costs are going down. And uh, I'm very strongly of the belief that subsidies should go down as production costs go down. I want to live in a world where community energy doesn't need subsidies, where renewable energy doesn't need subsidies. These are not permanent, and they've never been, I've never considered them to be permanent. They're about promoting deployment where costs are are not yet at grid parity. And solar costs have been falling significantly. And all the evidence I see is they're going to continue to fall uh, fairly dramatically. So the digression mechanism is there to have value for money for, for um, uh, consumers and to actually stimulate that innovation. So in a way, I'd, I'm not going to apologize for a system that I think actually uh, is about getting the right incentives in the system. Secretary of State. We're always learning. Thank you very much for coming along. I want to, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to put your hands together for our speakers. These are great, uh, great people who are committed and passionate to what they're doing and have given up their time to be with us this evening, uh, including you, Secretary of State, which I think demonstrates the level of commitment there is in trying to see the vision that we're promoting make it work. If you're not familiar with community energy and this is your first experience, uh, welcome to a world where you go from grand visions to arcane details about CFDs and rocks, you know, in an instant. Um, but that, that's how it shakes. Um, before we say, uh, before I let you go and get a glass of wine I, and, and let you thank our speakers, I just want to point out a couple of members of staff. So come find us, come find our speakers, tell us how you can work with us. Alex is over there. Alex has put all, Alex, you stand up. Alex has put everything together this evening, done a great job. Emily's over there, who did our first ever annual report uh, outstandingly. She's with uh, Belinda over there. Richard on the other side there has just started as our head of project finance. We've got Adam over there, who heads up our consulting uh, expertise and support. We've got our market failure over there, Chris Matthews. He was fingered as the market failure. He's come <laughs> to help us out.